Well, I'm so glad that you're here today. I should have introduced myself before. My name is Chris, and I'm the associate pastor here at Beacon. And I'm glad that you're here. Robert Kelly is our lead pastor, and he's away today on vacation. He'll be back next week. A lot of you guys have asked me in the last couple of weeks, so Robert's gone on vacation, huh? What's that like? You must be really busy. So, well, absolutely, I've been really busy. In fact, let me show you. We've, we've had a lot of important things to do this summer. Um, for example, uh, you know, ping pong ministry has been launched with my son. Um, this guy needed one-on-one -on -one discipleship. You know, a little contemplation and reflection. It wasn't just me. Trevor has also been very busy this summer. We went uh, body surfing in the water there, and uh, Trevor's also had some time for contemplation and study. <laughs> It's, it's been really stressful, actually, for us. Uh, Trevor uh, got thrown off the tube a couple times. You know, it's been, uh, it's been a really busy season for Trevor and I while Robert's been out of town. Um, but, you know, we're, we're trying to hold it together, and he'll be back next week. Don't worry. Um, like Trevor said, we're in our series called Mythbusters, which we've been really having a lot of fun with. And we've talked through kind of various myths, and some of them are more like cliches, but kind of like conventional wisdom that we're saying, it's conventional wisdom, but is, is it really true? Is it really wise? So this morning, the myth that we're going to challenge is this. Everything has an end, only a sausage has two. You may have never heard this myth before. <laughs> Everything has an end, only a sausage has two. The real myth is actually all good things must come to an end, which you have heard. Uh, but when I heard this one, it, it, just, it just struck me as so much more interesting. As uh, everything has an end, only a sausage has two. So we're gonna, that's what we're going to examine this morning. If uh, everything does have an end, uh, a sausage does have two. There's no, uh, well, like, there's like the patty kind of the, anyway. So this is what we're going to discuss. And I, I don't know about you, but you know, you're talking about all good things must come to an end. I feel this, don't you? I, I feel this all the time. You know, like, um, like when you're on vacation. Right? You're having a nice vacation, you're having a great time, but towards the end, you're always thinking to yourself, oh, this is almost done. Then what? This is so good, I can't believe. Or maybe it's short, or maybe it's just like a sunset. And you're just enjoying it, and you think, oh, it's going to be over soon. What am I going to do? For me, if I'm reading a good book, once I get towards the end, you know, once the stack I've already read is thick and the part to go is thin, I'm like a little bit sad. Am I the only one? You're like, oh, this book was so good, now it's over. That's why I still prefer the book over the movie, because the movie's like two hours that usually should have been an hour and a half. But the book, you know, is much longer. And I love to read books in series. When I was a kid, I did more reading than I do now. That's how I would pick my book. I'd go to the library, especially the kids' section. You know, all the books would match. There'd be like a blue hardcover or something. All these shelves. So I would try one. As long as I liked it, we'd go every Monday during the summer and I'd get four more, because that's all they allowed. Read those four and you could read like a whole series in the summer. So for me, there was like a summer of the Hardy Boys. You know, and I was really excited because they all match. And I know those books are much older than me, but I liked them. Or like the Louis L'Amour Westerns, you know, there's like a thousand of them it seems like. I, I love that because it, it doesn't end, but eventually it does. Well, parents, we feel this all the time, right? My kids are little, but I'm already feeling it. My littlest guy, Luke, turns two years old today. We're not going to sing. And, you know, I'm already feeling it. I'm like, wow, he's two. That went so fast. I perfectly remember the day he was born, like every detail, just like that. My older son goes to kindergarten next month. I'm like, you can't be serious. Because these things, it, it just seems like all good things come to an end so quickly. And I know you're with me on this. Maybe you feel this way, like, in the holidays, right? Christmas time, you're kind of looking forward to it. You have such a nice time around the tree, and then it's then it's over, right? You might feel this way uh, in college, right? When you're in college, you're having such a good time. If you went to school, then it's over. And then how many people, myself included, as soon as you get out of school, you're thinking, I should go back to school, <laughs> right? And then you end up going back because you, you, just, you just want more of that experience. And I know some of you guys, like, every few years, yeah, I'm going back to school again. You know, I paid off that loan, so I'm starting this. You know, it's just, you love it. It's so fun. But then it's over. You think, oh. It's come to an end. Or, you know, maybe it's your wedding. Maybe you're about to be married, or maybe you were married recently, so you really remember that you were looking forward to this day so much, it was really important to you, and now it's over. In fact, it went so fast, it's hard to remember some of the details. It's all good things come to an end, it seems like. I read an article this week in the Science Daily. I don't always read the Science Daily, but this week I came across this article that was exactly to this point. They said they have scientific proof that people enjoy planning their vacations more than they actually enjoy the trip. 
they, they told him to rank their happiness. It turns out the eight weeks before the trip is when you're the happiest, okay? Then you're on the trip, which is sort of okay. Then you come back. And they said the vast, vast, vast majority of people, I know you're all about to go on vacation, so I'm just going to warn you right now. The vast majority of people, when they get back from the vacation, they indicate no increased happiness whatsoever. There's a minority who took a very, very relaxing vacation, so this is not New Yorker style at all, that they got increased happiness for two weeks. So, and you can see this, right? I, I love this actually on Facebook. You can w watch people's status. Eight weeks until vacation, so excited. Six weeks, we're leaving. It's halfway over. Man, I hate this job. That's like what their wall says. And you're like, wow, that was fast. Like, you were the happiest guy on earth like two weeks ago. Then you went to the happiest place on earth, and now you're grumpy again. Like, how does that happen? But these things, they seem to cycle through so quickly. But what are those good things in life that do last forever? What are those things that don't have an end? Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3, if you would. There's Bibles scattered around the room, if you don't have one with you. I hope you'll turn to it. We're going to read uh, almost all of this chapter. Because we're going to look to the words of Paul, and he starts to talk about the Christian life. Does it have an end? Does it maybe have two ends? In fact, maybe this morning our goal is to prove that you are the sausage that the Christian life may in fact have two ends or have no ends at all. Colossians is written by the Apostle Paul or St. Paul, just like much of the New Testament. It was written uh, to a specific group of people in a certain town called Colossae, but its truth is universal and certainly applies to us and to our lives here today. So Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Right, we're going to pause there just for a second. So Paul is writing this, this letter to a specific church at the town of Colossae, to, to people who are very much alive. And he writes to them, and he says, verse 3, For you died. That's actually kind of weird, right? Sometimes we just read over these things, it's like, What? Like, imagine, you know, I stood up this morning, and I said, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Um, you've died. Be like, what are you talking about? And this is like a Bruce Willis thing, right, with Haley Joel Osment. He's like, I see dead people. Like, for you died? That doesn't even make sense. That's what Paul is saying, for you died. Then he's also talking about, well, you're going to spend eternity with Christ in glory. But that's not even the same end. He's already talking about two different ends in the first four verses. And then he's already talking about living forever with Christ. See, in these four verses, he's already laying out for us, I believe, in the Christian life, we do have two different ends. But actually, neither one of these ends is permanent. They're just kind of a point that you would pass through as we spend eternal life with Christ. What do we mean by that? Okay, the first end that every one of us will experience is when we pass away, when, when we die. We all know this. It's not a funny thing. It's true. We're all going to pass away. We've all had people we know and love that are gone. It's obvious. Paul is also saying, for you died. But he's not talking about that death. He's talking about the fresh start that a person should have when they choose a life of faith. When they choose to follow Christ. When they become a Christian. Paul is saying, that, that departure for you, that change in your life, is dramatic. You become a different person. You died. Jesus said it, the exact same truth, in a different way. John 3, he said, No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. It's the same concept, exactly. I know born again is now kind of an idiom, and it kind of refers to a group of people or even a style of worship, the born agains, all of that. This is, this is kind of the original, where Jesus is saying, quite literally, as a Christian, your life is so markedly changed, it's like you're starting over. The old person is gone, and there is a new person who's here. Paul says, you died. Jesus says, you were born again. It's the same idea. This end that a Christian experiences, that the old life that you have is gone. There's a new life in front of you. Second paragraph, Paul starts to kind of unpack what this starts to look like. He talks about kind of the morality of how a person lives who has decided to live a life of faith. Verse 5, he says, put to death, there it is again, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 
Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So Paul starts to talk about there the morality of a person who's chosen a life of faith, who's experienced this end. He's saying, put to death all of these attributes of your former life. And he starts talking about the things of morality. He says, don't lie, don't cheat, don't be dirty. He's talking about how a person begins to live from a moral standpoint when they've chosen to be a Christian, that you would die, all of these things previously would end. You would begin to take on a new character, a new spirit, a new attitude. But in the third paragraph is where he starts to talk about what the new person looks like. He talks about first, second paragraph, everything you're leaving behind. It's kind of this fulcrum. You've died here, all the things that stay behind. You know, lie, cheat, steal, greed, all of that left behind. But, third paragraph, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. So Paul is starting to draw a picture. See, a Christian who's living on this earth is really between these, these two ends. I told you, you are the sausage between these two ends to say we've, we're, we're putting to death all of these things that, that came before. And we're starting to live this life that's being fleshed out here uh, of kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, the attributes that are now brought into a person who's chosen to live the life of faith. And then in the fourth paragraph, Paul kind of sums it all up. He says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now I believe as we look to these two possible ends, that we could find that everyone on earth is pursuing one of them. If, they ha if they're not pursuing the kind of the overarching arc of eternal life through Christ. What do I mean by that? If a person is focused on the end of their human life, that that's kind of their, you know, the preoccupation, that's kind of their pursuit, that's kind of what they're after, what would a person like that look like? A person who lives every day completely sort of defined and made aware of their own finite time that they have here on this earth. Well, some of those people, they might be the ones who work all the time. They might say, you know, I have only a certain amount of time here on this earth before I'm gone, and while I'm here, I need to get as much done as I can because I won't be here. Because my time here is so limited, and if I don't work absolutely as much as I can, my life will be wasted. Or maybe they tell you the opposite. You know, we're only here so long. You know, I never knew anyone who on their deathbed said, I wish I would have worked more. So they say, no, no, I'm going to seek to have as, as good a time as I can in this world. I'm going to pursue pleasure as much as I can. I'm going to relax as much as I can. I'm going to get away as much as I can, pursue hobbies, interests, some sort of entertainment for themselves, because they know they only have a certain amount of time here, so they want to pursue enjoying it, right? Just do it. Live life to the fullest. We only have so much time on this earth. Maybe they invest everything they have into their relationships. Maybe they say, you know, everyone is here only for a short time. We've all had people taken away suddenly. I need to be investing as much as I can relationally into all the people that are around me. My children, my parents, my spouse, my neighbors, my friends, whatever relationships are absolutely most important to them. They say, I'm going to pour everything I have into these relationships. Or maybe they go into philanthropy. Maybe they give to foundations. Maybe they build a library at their school. Maybe they you know, serve in the community. They do good things. 
They say, well, I want my name to live on, and I'm only here for a good time. I need to have a positive impact. So they pour themselves into philanthropy, maybe. They say, I only have so much time here. Now, all of these things are good. They're fine. Some are better than others, but none of them are bad. Working hard, that's certainly completely in line with Scripture. Enjoying God's earth, absolutely. Doing good things in the community, investing in your relationships, those are all good things. There's not a single person who would deny that, that those are good things. But they are not the overall preoccupation that we should have. See, if any of those things rises from being a good thing to being your only thing, to being your ultimate thing, then it can actually reach the point where it stands between you and God. But what if a person isn't really focusing on that end? What if they're focusing on the end that says, this is the end of my life without God? I'm focusing on now living the right way. I don't want to be the old person anymore. Paul said, put that to death. I'm going to focus on this end. It is the one that is most important to me. So, they're going to be a good and moral person. Now, that's, that's a worthy pursuit. But to be a moral person is interesting because usually what you find is that to be a moral person is to be a better person. And better, by its very nature, is a comparative type study, right? It's sort of like math class, greater than, less than. You have to have two of something, or you can't be greater than, you can't be less than, you can't be better than. So sometimes when a person is saying, I'm going to choose this end, living the right way, that is my end that I am completely focused on, sometimes they can be a little bit critical. Because if, if they need to be better, then they have to define who they are better than. So they might look outside themselves. They say, well, I've decided to be better than you. I've decided to be better than him, her, them. And it becomes a comparative study for them. They say, this is the most important thing to me, that I can be better than you, because I can look at you. And in fact, the easiest way to make yourself feel better than them is instead of working on yourself, just criticize them, right? Because the lower you can beat them down, the better I look, the better I feel, because I am better than it can become overly critical. What if instead you don't look to anyone else, you, you continue to look to yourself and you say, I want to be better than I used to be. Okay. What are you going to do on the days that you're not? Sometimes that means we have to carry behind us overwhelming guilt because we're not better than. In fact, today I'm worse than. And where does that leave me? Because I wanted to be better than, but now I'm worse than. Or maybe it's not just guilt. Maybe there's kind of wild swings. Maybe you have only seasons where you're better than, but then others where you're worse than. Or maybe there's a, a day where you think, well, I've already blown it for today, so I can kind of write today off, do whatever I want. Tomorrow starts fresh. Because you want to be a better person, a, a morally upright person. Now, being a morally upright person is a good thing. But see, once it reaches the point that it becomes an ultimate thing, that that is the God that we worship, it's the end that we're focusing on, now it can actually stand between us and God. Because when we have as our pursuit to be a morally upright and good person, we're actually seeking to redeem and save ourselves by our own good works, instead of relying on grace through faith. See, we have these two ends that are important, but they're not the end all and the be all. Because we have to be able to look beyond them. For each of us, the true meaning and purpose in life comes from living in a trajectory that is eternal in arc, that is informed by these two ends. Our life is informed by these two ends, but it actually extends far beyond them. Paul, Paul talked about this at the beginning and the end of our passage. Verse 2, he said, Set your mind on the things above. What does he mean by that? See, we have to make sure we understand that both of these ends, that they relate on the long term to the Christian life that we have. In fact, the translation for that word, set your mind, could be translated even more simply as think on things above or have an inner disposition that we, we understand that the things above inform all of this below. Verse 17 at the end said, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul is telling us that the person of Christ needs to be absolutely on the forefront of our minds 
through all of this. In fact, he, he kind of alliterated it throughout our passage. It was 18 verses that we read. And in these 18 verses, he mentioned God or Christ directly 16 times in 18 verses. He's just hammering this point home over and over and over. That we understand the things of morality. We understand that none of us will live here forever. But it's all found in the person of Christ. Tell me if this phenomenon has ever happened to you. You kind of get interested in something new. Let's say you're thinking about buying a different car. So you get a little bit of interest and you think, oh, I really like uh, Honda minivan. That's what I like. And there's not a lot of them around. I like that. I like that. It'll be a little different. So you're thinking about this. Then you take a drive. What happens? What do you see everywhere? You know. Honda minivans, right? You see them everywhere. Suddenly it's become, a, you're aware of it, and you see it everywhere. My kids do this. They crack me up. They, they know the cars of what like, all of you guys drive. I don't know how. I don't know this. <laughs> they know what everyone drives. It cracks me up. So we'll easily, we'll be driving along, going wherever, and one of them will shout out from the back, Granny's car! Now, it's not usually Granny's car. It's usually a little silver car. But they kind of have it on the mind, they have it on the brain, and they, they just, now they see the little silver cars everywhere. Cheryl Kelly, you know, Robert's wife, she has a Chevy, so she has the Chevy bow tie on the front. My little guy will see any Chevy. He just sees that symbol, Cheryl's car. I'm like, well, actually, that's a car commercial. Cheryl's car. He just knows. They kind of have it on the brain. Scholars call this perceptual vigilance. We tend to notice things that are immediately important to us. I was thinking about buying a camera. I'd never seen one anywhere. That week, I met three people who had it. I'm like, I thought I was like the first one to ever think of this. <laughs> but you, you get this perceptual vigilance where whatever catches your mind, whatever is important to you, tends to catch your attention. This is exactly what Paul is telling us, that we need to, whenever we look at these ends, whenever we look into our relationships, whenever we look into morality, we need to instead see Christ. We need to be living every day in the light of that information. Warren Wearsby said it this way, Look at others and be distressed. Look at yourself and be depressed. Look to God and you'll be blessed. And it's a matter of this eternal perspective that must be a part of our everyday thinking. And it's not easy. It's not easy to constantly step back and see the bigger picture. Because it... The, the minutia, it draws us in. And we, we start to invest heavily in this world because we're, you know, we're feeling the finite nature of our time and our place here. And we start to really work on the things of morality because we are displeased when we see those things in ourselves. And instead, we can lose sight of God. We lose sight of that eternal perspective. Now, along with this, I think comes kind of as a sidebar. Along with this comes an additional responsibility in a way. Because remember, I told you, I think everyone is stuck on either the first end, the second end, or they're growing in the eternal perspective. Every single person is stuck in one of those places. And every one of us knows people that are stuck. Not only do we get stuck ourselves, but we can see it in others. And this is the opportunity that we have to be building into people's lives. This is the opportunity we have to be sharing Christ, to be sharing the things of faith with others, because we can see people that, you know, when they're, when they're stuck at one of these ends, it can be a very, very difficult place. Because when one of these things that's a very good thing, but not the ultimate thing, is taken away, if we're focusing on them as our ultimate thing, it can be life-shattering. If relationships have become the most important thing in our lives, when they're shattered, we don't know what to do with ourselves. When our own morality has become the most important thing in our lives, when we make a mistake, we don't even know what to do anymore. And when we see that in others, that is our opportunity to be sharing and helping others understand that all of this falls under the bigger picture, the long story. The story that each of us has the opportunity to live eternal life with God. Because the only way to not focus on one end or the other is to replace it with the focus and a perspective for the long term. Thomas Chalmers said it this way, There is not one personal transformation in which the heart is left without an object of ultimate beauty and joy. 
The heart's desire for one particular object can be conquered, but its desire to have some object is unconquerable. The only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new one. The only way we can step back and move beyond the, the over-focus on one of these ends is by being eternally kind of informed by our perspective of the life of Christ. This summer we took our family vacation to Florida. And uh, that's kind of a new thing for me. I'm not a native New Yorker. I've only been, I've been here 10 years, but I didn't grow up here. And I know most of you who grew up here, you did the Florida road trip thing, right? How many of you have driven from here to Florida? Yeah, and there's like five hands not up. I bet three of you just don't like raising your hand in church. Okay, and so this was my first one, right? And we had a great time. I loved it. It was, it was, it was, it was a blast. One of the things we did is we went to the Kennedy Space Center. We're a little bit nerdy, I guess. So we went there, and we had a great time. And the highlight of the tour right now at the Kennedy Space Center, if you haven't been there recently, is the Saturn V rocket. Now, I wasn't around when we were using the Saturn V rocket, but they told us all about it. See, you can understand, you don't really get to see the current equipment up close at all. Like, it's, it's hidden away and secure. And, but you can see the Saturn V rocket. This thing is 363 feet long. Okay? If you lay it down, it covers the entire football field, including the end zones. I don't even think it would fit on our property here. Okay? It's huge. It is the largest vehicle ever made in terms of height and weight and payload. Nothing has ever been this big or this tall or carried this much. It was actually a moving vehicle. And you know, they talked about how they had to make it all over the country, that pieces had to come in on barges, and of course it was single use, so they had to keep making another one and another one, but it never failed them. And as the Saturn V's went to the moon, the kind of the scientific breakthrough, as I understand it, that got us to the moon was the understanding of the stages of the mission. See, the mission had these, these points that it had to pass through, kind of these false ends. First thing Saturn V had to do, leave orbit, uh, leave the Earth, make it to orbit. So it would leave Earth, and the astronauts would be orbiting the globe. And there, some of the rocket would, would dispatch. It would be gone. And that was the first false end. The second part was they would use the gravitational pull of the Earth as kind of a slingshot to build up more speed, and then they would apply power, and then they would go to the moon. Then they had to pass both of these benchmarks. They had to leave Earth from terra firma, from the ground. Then they had to leave orbit. Both of these things were incredibly important to the mission but neither one were the actual goal. They were a benchmark that had to be passed through. It was the way to successfully complete this project, but it wasn't the goal. The goal was going to the moon. So I would, I would encourage us this morning to not get stuck on the ground or even get stuck in orbit, but to always be looking beyond all that, all that is kind of here and close and is noisy and is loud, and to find that eternal perspective, to live in a way that it, yes, is good and is moral, but is completely informed by the love that we have in the eternal life that we spend with Christ. So let's pray together. God, I'm so thankful this morning for the truth of your scripture. I'm thankful that you love us, that you accept us, that you draw us to yourself. God, I am so thankful that when we, when we die, when we pass from this earth, that it's to spend eternity with you for all of those who follow Christ. And God, I'm so thankful that when you redeem us, when you call us to yourself while we live here on this earth, that you do call us to live in a better way. You do call us to live in ways that are pure and holy. But God, teach each of us to be so aware of you in daily life, to hear your voice, to see your words, God, and to act on your behalf. God, allow us to reflect you into the lives of those who surround us. Teach us to be the people that you would have us to be. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.